Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the 30th of the 11th month on our Creator's calendar as we reckon it, which happens to line up with the 11th of February, 2023. And we are finishing our read-through of the section of the Apostolic Constitutions called the uh, about heresies. This is specifically sections 4, 5, and 6, which cover his covenant, then the law, and how we're supposed to regard it today. So very, in, very important information here, very worthy of our uh, looking into it and testing for ourselves all things. So right here, this is section 4 of the law. Just to back up, they mention a list of names here of people that they anointed. It says, For we ourselves, as we passed through the nations and confirmed the assemblies, curing some with much exhortation and healing words, restored them again when they were in a certain way to death. But those that were incurable we cast out from the flock, like Simon the magician, Nicholas, and the other people that became heretics, right? And started Gnostic movements that caused problems. That they might not infect the lambs, which were found with their scabby disease, but might continue before Yahuwah Elohim, pure and undefiled, sound and unspotted. And this we did in every city, everywhere through the whole world, and have left to you the overseers and to the rest of the ministers if you remember all of these writings as it was foretold in second baruch were hidden in that fourth beast which is the roman empire and they changed things to suit their own purposes where there's no more kohanim they put priests and they have their priests even today but that wasn't how they set it up originally with the yachad if you will um if you look at the life of our Mashiach and what he walked out in his passion, it foretells what would happen to the truth in history as well. He was abused by his own and mistreated, and then he was given over to the Romans to make him unrecognizable as a man and kill him. So that's what happened to the truth in the fourth beast. That's why all these texts that we have, even in the common scriptures, are tampered with, and we have to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good by confirming everything with multiple witnesses, as he said to. But moving on, it says, And to the rest of the Kohanim, this very Yechad doctrine, worthily and righteously, as a memorial or confirmation to those who have believed in Elohim. And we have sent it by our fellow minister, Clement, our most trustworthy and intimate son in Yahuwah, together with Barnabas and Timothy, our most dearly beloved son. And the genuine Mark, together with whom we recommend to you also Titus and Luke, and Jason and Lucius and Sosipater. And then Romans 16.21 is where some of these gentlemen are mentioned. So context of who's being spoken of here. This is by whom also we exhort you in Yahuwah to abstain from your old conversation, vain bonds separations, observances, distinctions of meat or meats, meaning what's clean and what's abominable, what you can't touch after they're dead or what you shouldn't touch at all. All right. The, the things that were added bonds because of transgressions, but not what you consider food. All right. Daily washings for the old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. To those that speak evil of the law, for since you have known El through Yahushua Mashiach and all his teachings, as it has been from the beginning, that he gave a plain law to assist the law of nature, such a one as is pure, delivering, and set apart, in which his own name was inscribed, perfect, which is never to fail, being complete in ten commands, unspotted, converting the inner beings, which when the Hebrews forgot, he put them in mind of it by the foreteller Malachi, 
saying, Remember the Torah of Moshe, the man of El, who gave you in charge commandments and ordinances, which law is so very set apart and righteous that even our deliverer, when on a certain time he healed one leper, and afterwards nine, said to the first, Go show yourself to the high Kohen. And he did that because it was the Kohen's job alone to declare a man clean from leprosy. It was the Torah at the time. And offer the gift which Moshe commanded for a testimony unto them. And afterwards to the nine, go show yourselves to the Kohenim. Luke 17, 14. For he nowhere has dissolved the law, as Simon pretends, but fulfilled it. For he says, one yod or one tittle shall not pass from the Torah until all be fulfilled. For says he, I come not to dissolve the Torah, but to fulfill it. For Moshe himself, who was at once the lawgiver and the high Kohen and the foreteller and the king, and Eliyahu, the zealous follower of the foretellers, were present at our Yahuwah's transfiguration in the mountain and witnesses of his incarnation and of his sufferings, as the intimate friends of Mashiach, but not as enemies and strangers. Whence it is demonstrated that the Torah is pleasant and set apart, as also the foretellers. Which is the Torah of nature, and which is that afterwards introduced, and why it was introduced? Introduced, sorry. Now, the Torah is the Ten Commandments, or the Ten Matters or Words, which Yahuwah promulgated to them with an audible voice before the people made that calf which represented the Egyptian Apis. And the Torah is righteous, and therefore it is called the Torah, which means instructions, or the covenant of light made evident. Because right rulings are thence made according to the Torah of nature, which the followers of Shimon, or Simon, abuse, supposing they shall not be judged thereby, and so shall escape punishment. If you're not familiar, he was also part of the, like, Serinthus and the Nicolaitans. They had ideas that you would have to do every kind of evil or licitious thing to move on from this life into the next world and upgrade yourself with some of the heretical beliefs that they had and that it was the only way to be free from demons or evil influences it was perversions by demons but these are some of the things that they held to this law is pleasant set apart and such as lays no compulsion in things positive for he says if you will make me an altar you shall make it of earth it does not say make one, but if you will make. It does not impose a necessity, but gives leave to their own free liberty. For Elohim does not stand in need of sacrifices, being by nature above all want. But knowing that as of old, Avel, beloved of El, and Noach and Abraham, and those that succeeded, without being required, but only moved of themselves by the Torah of nature, did offer sacrifice to Eloah out of a grateful mind. So he did now permit the Hebrews, not commanding them, but if they had a mind, permitting them, and if they offered from a right intention, showing himself pleased with their sacrifices. Therefore, he says, if you desire to offer, do not offer to me as to one that stands in need of it, for I stand in need of nothing. For the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. But when this people became forgetful of that, and called upon a calf as Elohim, instead of the true El, and to him did ascribe the cause of their coming out of Egypt, saying, These are your mighty ones, Yisrael, which have brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, or Egypt. And when these men had committed wickedness with the similitude of a calf that eats hay, and denied Elohim who had visited them by Moshe in their afflictions, and had done signs with his hand and rod. 
and had smitten the Egyptians with ten plagues, who had divided the waters of the Reed Sea into two parts, who had led them in the midst of the water as a horse upon the ground, who had drowned their enemies and those that laid in wait for them, who at Mara had made sweet the bitter fountain, who had brought water out of the sharp rock till they were satisfied, who had overshadowed them with a pillar of cloud on account of the immoderate heat, and with a pillar of fire, which enlightened and guided them when they knew not the way which they were to go, who gave them manna from Shamayim, and gave them quails for flesh from the sea, who gave them the Torah in the mountain, whose voice he had vouchsafed to let them hear, him did they deny, and said to Aharon, Make us mighty ones who shall go before us. And they made a molten calf and sacrificed to an idol. Then was Elohim angry, as being ungratefully treated by them, and bound them with bonds which could not be loosed, with a mortifying burden and a hard collar, and no longer said, If you make, but make an altar and sacrifice perpetually, for you are forgetful and ungrateful. And here's an example. This is what he meant by the, the law that was added after transgression. Okay, It was all of the, the washings, the purgations, the separations from the dead, the removing the unclean, all the different things that you had to do were added bonds because of transgression for the purpose of teaching them righteousness and having them remember who it was that delivered them. It says, offer burnt offerings, therefore, continually, morning and evening, right, every day, that you may be mindful of me, for since you have wickedly abused your power, I lay a necessity upon you for the time to come. And I command you to abstain from certain meats, and I ordain you the distinction of clean and unclean creatures. Although this was known even before then, if you recall, in the time of Moshe, or in the time of Noach, rather, when he was bringing the animals into the, into the ark, or the tavar, he brought them two and two, male and female, according to their kinds, one pair of unclean animals and seven pairs of clean. But it says, although every creature is good as being made by me, and I appoint you several separations, purgations, frequent washings and sprinklings, several purifications, and several times of rest. And if you neglect any of them, I determine that punishment which is proper to the disobedient, that being pressed and galled by your collar, you may depart from your error of polytheism. And laying aside that, these are your mighty ones, Yisrael, you may be mindful that here, or Shema Yisrael, Yahuwah your Elohim is one Yahuwah, and may run back again to that Torah which is inserted by me in the nature of all men, that there is only one El in Shemaim and on earth, and to love him with all your heart and with all your might, and with all your mind, and to fear none but him, nor to admit the names of other mighty ones into your mind, nor to let your tongue utter them out of your mouth. He bound them for the hardness of their hearts, that by sacrificing and resting and purifying themselves and by similar observances, they might come to the knowledge of El who ordained these things for them. That we who believe in Mashiach are under favor and not under the servitude of that additional law. But Ashrei, or happy, th this word right here, Asher, means who, which, that, or possibly when, right? But it's Ashrei, who will be happy, prosperous, confirmed, walking straight, authenticated, right? It means all those things and blessed. But Asherah, or happy are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Matith Yahu 13, 16. Yours, I say, who have believed in the one L, not by necessity, 
but by a sound comprehension, in obedience to him that called you. For you are released from the bonds and freed from the servitude. For, says he, I call you no longer servants but friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father have I made known unto you. Yahukanon 15.15 15. For to them that would not see nor hear, not for the want of those senses, but for the excess of their wickednesses or wickedness, I gave statutes that were not good, and judgments whereby they would not live. Yehezkiel or Ezekiel twenty twenty five. They are looked upon as not pleasant, as burnings and a sword, as medicines are esteemed enemies by the sick, and impossible to be observed on account of their obstinacy. Whence also they brought death upon them, not or being not obeyed. That the Torah for sacrifices is additional, which Mashiach, when he came, took away. It says, You therefore are Ashrei, or happy, who are delivered from the curse. For Mashiach, the Ben, or son of El, by his coming has confirmed and completed the Torah, but has taken away the additional precepts, although not all of them. Like the feasts are perpetual. You can find in Tobi Yahu that he kept the feast outside of the land, and he was of the tribe of... Oh. Now it's escaping me. He wasn't of Ephraim and Renashe, Naphtali, there we go. Tobiyahu and his son were of the tribe of Naphtali, and while he was in Nineveh, he kept the feast as best he was able by inviting the poor in and having meals and enjoying themselves to the best of their ability. We also have the example of the, the renewed covenant times. They were keeping the feast with the peoples outside of the land and then even coming in to keep the feast on occasion, which is recorded by Shaul. I have, by all means, have to keep this feast in Yerushalayim. Right, and then you have the apostolic constitutions here where it actually enumerates the things and what you're supposed to do on some of the feast days. Although, again, we have an abridged version of the what was originally given. I believe that the dedicate or the teaching of the 12 might have something else in regard to those things as well. But keeping the feasts, the dietary laws, some of these added bonds were never revoked. And that's things that we have to be circumspect with. It says, yet at least the more grievous ones, having confirmed the former and abolished the latter, and has again set the free will of man at liberty, not subjecting him to the penalty of a temporal death, but giving Torot, which is the plural of Torah, it means instructions, to him according to another constitution. Wherefore, he says, if any man will come after me, let him come. Matith Yahu 16.24 And again, will you also go away? Yahu Hanan 6.67 And besides, before his coming, he refused the sacrifices of the people, while they frequently offered them, when they sinned against him and thought he was to be appeased by sacrifices, but not by repentance. For thus he speaks, Why do you bring to me frankincense from Sabah, and cinnamon from a remote land? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, and your sacrifices are not sweet to me. And afterwards, gather your burnt offerings together with your sacrifices, and eat flesh. For I did not command you, when I brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. Yeremiah 7, 21 and 22. And he says by Yeshayahu, or Isaiah, To what purpose do you bring me a multitude of sacrifices, says Yahuwah? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams, and I will not accept the fat of lambs, and the blood of bulls and of goats. Nor do you come and appear before me, for who has required these things at your hands? 
do not go on and tread my courts any more. If you bring me fine flour, it is vain. Incense is an abomination unto me. Your new months and your Sabbaths and your great day, I cannot bear them. Your fasts and your rests and your feasts, my inner being hates them. I am overfull of them. And he says by another, Depart from me, the sound of your hymns and the psalms of your musical instruments, I will not hear. And Shemuel says to Shaul, when he thought to sacrifice, Obedience is better than sacrifice, and hearkening than the fat of rams. For behold, Yahuwah does not so much delight in sacrifice as in obeying him. And he says by Dawid, I will take no calves out of your house, nor he goats out of your flock. If I should be hungry, I would not tell you, for the whole world is mine, and the fullness thereof. Shall I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? Sacrifice to Elohim the sacrifice of praise, and pay your vows to the Most High. And in all the scriptures, in like manner, he refuses their sacrifices on account of their sinning against him. For the sacrifices of the impious are an abomination with Yahuwah, since they offer them in an unlawful manner. It mentions in some place in the Dead Sea Scrolls, I don't know exactly where, I believe it's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, though, that when you make an offering, you're offering up your entire soul, your entire inner being as well in the offering. And if you're not walking right, if you're sinning, then that, that sacrifice is not acceptable. It's like a blemished offering. And again, their sacrifices are to them as bread of lamentation. All that eat of them shall be defiled. If therefore before his coming he sought for a clean heart and a contrite ruach more than sacrifices, much rather would he abrogate those sacrifices, I mean those by blood, when he came. Yet he so abrogated them as that he first fulfilled them, for he was both circumcised and sprinkled, or immersed, right, and offered sacrifices and whole burnt offerings and made use of the rest of their customs. And he that was the Torah giver became himself the fulfilling of the Torah, not taking away the Torah of nature, but abrogating those additional laws that were afterwards introduced, although not all of them neither. And there's another part in the Dead Sea Scrolls that specifically says the intelligent at those times or out throughout all times, will studiously look into the laws to see which ones are still applicable for them in those times. And that's a great example of how the law would change by necessity depending on circumstances. In the community rule and the Damascus document, you have what is like a precursor to the apostolic constitutions. It was constitution for believers on how to be outside of the land, but before he came. It was outside of being in Yerushalayim and being able to do the sacrifices there and keep the perpetual offerings. The only thing they did was they had the added bonds because of transgression that they still kept. It was not done away with at that time. However, they had to, of necessity, have different set of rules for how they could behave because they couldn't do those offerings anywhere else. And they used scripture to, to um, confirm the things that they were doing. Just like Oni Yahu, the son of the high Kohen, when there was persecution with the Greeks, he fled to Egypt. And he used the foretelling of a, of a place being built in Egypt as a sign that he was supposed to build something there. He was put in favor with one of the Cleopatras, I believe. And he had, they had built a, a replica of the Hekel where they made offerings and did things in Egypt at that time. That was eventually destroyed. But his children became generals of her army, and they spread out. And that was some of the um, some of the beginnings of the Yahudim, although it was sons of Louis, in Africa. There, Alexandria also filled up with some Yahudim 
and eventually those would have been persecuted and left and went south too, along with the ones that were sold into slavery after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. But that's uh, that's for a different time. However, they not always saying they're right, but these things were foretold in his word and men desiring to follow him would look into it and see these things and act accordingly. The things that you can find in the constitutions for the Dead Sea Scrolls are very similar to what you have here. The major difference is the added bonds of because of transgression were no longer applicable. And he's going to go into more detail as we go right here. It says, How Mashiach became a fulfiller of the Torah and what parts of it he put a period to or changed or transferred. And this is just like circumcision wasn't from the beginning, but being made male and female was. So the idea of a man and a woman being joined together, and that was perpetual. It's going to be eventually where we're all made like messengers, but the things that were first and then added later are also things that can be changed. And this is what he gets into detail with. You can find examples of it as we go, but if you read how they were before the Torah came, they were doing things that later the Torah prohibited. That's another example of how he can change things. So there's a lot of people that will think that our Mashiach was never able, was not permitted to change anything in the Torah, but only obey it. And he he's quite clearly called the Torah and the Torah giver. And you can see even examples within the common scriptures where he's changed things as it goes. It says, for he did not take away the Torah of nature, but confirmed it. For he that said in the Torah, Yahuwah, your Elohim is one Yahuwah. It, the same says in the Besorah, or good news, that they might know you, the only true Elohim. Yahukanon 17.3 And he that said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19.18 says in the glad tidings, renewing the same precept, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. Yahukanon 13.34 He who then forbade murder, now does now forbid causeless anger. So even being angry at your brother in your heart. Matith Yahu 5.22 He that forbade adultery, does now forbid all unlawful lust. Even looking at a woman to lust after her is adultery in your heart. Right? He that forbade stealing now pronounces him most happy, who supplies those that are in want out of his own labors. Luke or Lucas 12, 31 through 38, and Acts 20, 35. He that forbade hatred now pronounces him happy that loves his enemies. Matith Yahu 5 7. He that forbade revenge now commands long suffering. Matith Yahu 5 43. Not as if righteous revenge were an unrighteous thing, but because long suffering is more excellent. Nor did he make laws to root out our natural passions, but only to forbid the excess of them. Matith Yahu 5 38. He who commanded to honor our parents was himself subject to them. Luke 2.51 He, and this is a key thing, he never does or commands anything that he has not done himself. Even judgment of who's going to die. He, he does nothing unrighteous that he hasn't himself been subjected to. He who, had, and that's why it says that because he's the son of Adam, all, he was given all authority. This is the meaning of that. Because he made himself subject and he's only doing what he's done himself, he gave up all riches and greatness and impoverished himself for the benefit of giving to all men. And he enjoins that very kind of thing. Right? He who had commanded to keep the Shabbat by resting thereon for the sake of meditating on the laws has now commanded us to consider the Torah of creation and of providence every yom or day, and to return thanks to Elohim. 
he abrogated circumcision when he had himself fulfilled it. For he it is, or he it was, to whom the inheritance was reserved, who was the expectation of the nations. Genesis 49.10 He who made a Torah for swearing rightly and forbade perjury has now charged us not to swear at all. Matthew Yahu 5.33 and it mentions that we're not to swear at all, but if we have to, if we're compelled to, by all means to keep our word, because it, breaking an oath is a horrible thing. He has in several ways changed immersion, sacrifice, the kahuna, and the el breathe service, which was confined to one place. For instead of daily immersions, he has given only one which is that into his death. Instead of one tribe, he has appointed that out of every nation the best should be ordained for the kahuna, or for ministry, and that not their bodies should be examined for blemishes, but their religion and their lives. Instead of a bloody sacrifice, he has appointed that reasonable and unbloody mystical one of his body and blood, which is performed to represent the death of the master by symbols. And I put it as a footnote. He gave us praise as an offering as well. This may be a translation issue um, with what they try to do with the transubstantiation, right? But he did give us the offering of his blood and, and body and symbols with the bread and wine, what we call communion that a body of born-again believers are supposed to do. And when you do that, you stay in eternal life. All of those things are clearly mentioned in Scripture. It says, Instead of the El Breathe service confined to one place, he has commanded and appointed that he should be esteemed from sun rising to sun setting in every place of his dominion. It says in the Psalms, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of Yahuwah shall be praised, right? And it's literally enjoined in the apostolic constitutions that morning and evening, be local believers are supposed to acknowledge him and, and fellowship together and sing his praises. He did not, therefore, take away the Torah from us, but the bonds. For concerning the Torah, Moshe says... You shall meditate on the word which I command you, sitting in your house and rising up and walking in the way. And Dawid says his delight is in the Torah of Yahuwah, and in his Torah he will meditate day and night. For everywhere would he have us subject to his Torot or instructions, but not transgressors of them. For, says he, happy are the undefiled in the way who walk in the Torah of Yahuwah. Happy are they that search out his testimonies. With their whole heart shall they seek him. And again, happy are we, Yisrael, because those things which are pleasing to El are known to us. Baruch 4, verse 4. And Yahuwah says, If you know these things, happy are you, if you do them. Yahukanon 13, 17. Now this part's been tampered with a little bit, but we'll go ahead and read it so you can see. It says that it pleased Yahuwah that the law of righteousness should be demonstrated by the Romans. It should probably be Gentiles there, right? And this is a footnote that I put. It says this title and the following section are corrupted as Rome is the fourth beast of Daniel. It's the fourth beast kingdom that you can read about. It's the feet and legs of iron and the feet of iron and miry clay. If you remember, the clay is his people. And when the pagan Roman fell, it was in, it was taken over and split into ten kingdoms, three being uprooted before the little horn arose, which was the overseer of the bishop, uh, the bishop of Rome, that became it was the anti mashiach right? But the fourth beast in both Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar's visions was Rome, the legs of iron, and then also the uh, in fourth Ezra. It's described the fourth beast of Daniel is given more detail as a three-headed eagle. 
and it starts with the Caesars of Rome with Julius and then Augustus being the longest reign. So you can get a lot of different information from that, but it's absolutely demonstrably shown. You can also have direct references of this after they came, I believe, uh, in the anti-Nicene writings and in some of the publications from those people. It talks about how Rome would be is the fourth beast, and when the three and when it's broken up into ten kingdoms and the three are plucked up, that's when that the Nicolaitans took power there. It doesn't mention Nicolaitans like that, but that's when the little horn came to power. And I think we already run over it, but if you look at Daniel and you pay careful attention, there's two little horns mentioned. There's a little horn in chapter 7, I believe, which is from the Grecian Empire or the third beast kingdom. And that is Antiochus Epiphanes that's mentioned with, and then the coming of the Maccabees. We read about that during Hanukkah. And then in the fourth beast empire, there's also the little horn that, that comes to power, and that would be the office of the Bishop of Rome. I don't use the word Pope because that means father, and we're not to call any man father, just so you know. I usually call a little horn. But uh, these things are hidden today due to the Counter-Reformation, although you can even find in our lifetime he was denounced as the Antichrist uh, when he went to go speak in the the house in Britain, I believe it was, the house of the commons or the house of the one of their elected bodies, one of the men denounced him and was kicked out for it. So moving on, it says, this title and the following section are corrupted as Rome is the fourth beast, a.k.a. the beast out of the sea. The Catholic Church is the scarlet woman riding the beast, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And that's also what you can see in the ancient history of Caldonia with Kadoshi McIsaac's foretelling, where the, the scarlet woman was mixing her wine and abominations with their people who had the belief in our Mashiach. And throughout that history, you can see the downfall of the Caldonians was intermixing and allowing Catholics to have a prominence in the country. Same thing that happened to America, by the way, and same thing that's happening to every country in the world. Just like, and again, this is another foreshadowing. I don't mean to go off on tangents, but I'm trying to help you get the sense of this stuff. When you have the microcosm of what happened in the in the beginning, it, there's nothing new under the sun. History repeats itself. So as the 12 brothers were all together and some persecuted Yahusuf, sold him into slavery, he was brought up into slavery, cast into prison, and then released and made second to Pharaoh. And then he caused all, all the the world, the, all the resources and everything to fall under the purview of the Pharaoh. And he took control of it all for him. That was culminated in history with his children. So you had the persecution, the outcasting of the northern kingdom, the, the persecutions by the brothers and attacks, the imprisonment, if you will, of the dark ages, and then the release of the Reformation where they came to prominence and they were American, Britain and became a, a nation and company of nations and a great nation, if you will. They spread the good news and all that. That's now also being used by Rome to subdue the world back to Pharaoh, if you will, or back to Rome, which is exactly what's been going on since those times. So <clears throat> it says, uh, the Catholic church is the scarlet woman riding the beast, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, and the bishop of the Roman church is the anti mashiach we, we are pleaded with to come out of her for our own well-being. What this originally said is hidden for now, but kept for us for all not to be ignorant of what he has allowed and the consequences of poor choices. Adding and taking away from what is written. We are to turn the other cheek, not punish the bad. And then this is what the text says here. It says, now does he desire or nor does he desire that the Torah of righteousness should be or should only be demonstrated by us. But he is pleased that it should appear and shine by means of the Romans. And I put nations here, right? For these Romans believing in Yahuwah left off their polytheism and unrighteousness and entertain the good and punish the bad. But they hold the Yahudim under tribute and do not suffer them to make use of their own ordinances. <clears throat> and again, 
they're foretold as the fourth beast kingdom. Originally, the Roman assembly did serve our creator faithfully, trustworthily, if you will. Clement of Rome was one of the assembly, one of the overseers. He was killed by his own cousin Domitian with the persecutions during that time when Yahukanan was exiled to Patmos. The other, there's the pastor of Hermas, who was at the palace of the Britons in Rome, who was an overseer of that assembly, and he was of the belief, and he wrote the shepherd of Hermas. But it was later overrun. They were persecuted and killed, and Nicolaitans took over. How Elohim, on account of their impiety towards Mashiach, made the Yahudim captives and placed them under tribute. Because indeed they drew servitude upon themselves voluntarily when they said, We have no king but Caesar. Yahukanan 19 15. And this is very important, just like you find throughout the recognitions of Clement and in other places, two or more witnesses confirm every matter. Kepha would ask multiple times, and it's enjoined in the Apostolic Constitutions that when you're picking an overseer, you ask the people multiple times. And just like you can read in the beginning in Exodus when they're getting the covenant, three times they say, all that Yahuwah says we will hear and we will do. Three times they agree to have him as their Elohim, and they affirm the matter that way. Three times when he came to them, they rejected our Mashiach and said that we have no we have no we have no king but Caesar. Impale him, impale him, right? So they confirmed the matter with their own mouth. Let his blood be on us and our children, right? This is and if we do not slay Mashiach, all men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and will take away both our place and nation. Yahukanon eleven forty eight. Scripture says what the wrong ones fear will come upon them, which is exactly what happened. And so they foretold unwittingly. For accordingly, the nations believed on him, and they themselves were deprived by the Romans of their power and of their legal worship. And they have been forbidden to slay whom they please and to sacrifice when they will. Wherefore, they are accursed. As cursed is he who does not do all the words in this Torah or fulfill all the words of this Torah, right? And like Brother Leander had mentioned, Leviticus 26, and I believe it's Deuteronomy 28, has the curses of the covenants and what would happen to the people for not being obedient to everything. This is wherefore they are accursed as not able to perform the things they are commanded to do. For says he, Cursed be he that does not continue in all things that are written in the book of the Torah to do them. Now it is impossible in their dispersion, while they are among the heathen, for them to perform all the things in their Torah. For the Elbreath Moshe forbids both to rear an altar out of Yerushalayim and to read the Torah out of the bounds of Yahuda. Now this one... I don't know of the reference for, I can't recall it in my mind, but if it's not actually in the common scriptures, that's just another another evidence of something that's been removed. There's quite a bit of the things that you can find quotes from places in scripture that don't exist anymore and things that were hidden. There was a whole verse, the noon in Psalm 145 was unknown. It was quoted in the Apostle of the Constitutions, but, and it was directly about our Mashiach, but it was unknown until the Dead Sea Scrolls were revealed, and they found that it was in there. And then it was also in a in a different translation, in a different language of that psalm, if I recall, the Syriac version. So there's different pieces here and there. You can find different places, but it just confirms what we have today is an abridged version. Sometimes it's a tourniqueted version of the fullness of what his word used to be. You can see that most prominently when you read, like, the errors or the the information in the book of Hanok about how the moon functions. It's quite uh, abridged compared to what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which takes up a massive amount of information and goes through a three-year cycle that perpetually repeats itself as part of its sign that you're in following the right calendar. 
another section is in the Testament of Louis, in the Greek translation that we have, when he's repenting and turning to our Creator, it says, and he prayed. And then it shows that he had a vision and his prayer was being answered. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls version that they had, the fragments of it, you actually have that he washed himself, he could put on clean garments, and he actually has the prayer that he said. And everything that he enjoined was given to him. So there's quite a bit difference there. When we go along through the, the book of Exodus, you'll also see that there's quite a bit that's been removed from there, whether or not it was because of redundancy or whatever opinion they might have. The fact remains that whole sections are taken out because it's repetitive or because of whatever reason. But once you see the contrast there, it makes a huge difference. What Yahuwah said to do, Moshe does exactly, things happen in their benefit. What Yahuwah says to do, he obeys it exactly, benefit. And, and again and again and again, you see that pattern so that when he says Yahuwah said what to do and he did contrary, bam, it makes a huge stark difference. And that's why he says, that's it. You're not going into the promised land. Before, when you read the account, it might seem that that was like, oh, that's kind of harsh. That's kind of an arbitrary punishment. You know, why, why do that? That's the only thing he did. It's a minor thing. But when you see the whole totality of instant obedience and the benefit of it, and then you see that he despised him and didn't set him apart in the eyes of the people when he did that. And it makes a huge difference. You miss that when you don't have the context of what was taken out. So we'll, when we get there, you'll see it more clearly. <clears throat> but it says, let us therefore follow Mashiach, that we may inherit his birach oath or blessings. Let us walk after the Torah and the foretellers by the good news. Let us eschew or cast away the worshippers of many mighty ones, and the murderers of Mashiach, and the murderers of the foretellers, and the wicked and atheistical heretics. Let us be obedient to Mashiach as to our king, as having authority to change several constitutions, and having as a legislator, chokma or wisdom, to make new constitutions in different circumstances. Yet so that everywhere the Torot or instructions of nature be immutably preserved. And that's the Ten Commandments and the things that will never change to love him with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself, right? Section five, the teaching of the sent ones in opposition to Yahudi and Gentile superstitions, especially in regard to marriage and funerals. It says that we ought to avoid the heretics as the corruptors of souls or inner beings. You should therefore, O overseer, and you of the people, Avoid all heretics who abuse the law and the foretellers, for they are enemies to El Shaddai, and disobey him, and do not confess Mashiach to be the Ben of El, or the son of El. For they also deny his generation according to the flesh. They are ashamed of the stake. They abuse his passion and his death. They know not the resurrection. They take away his generation before all ages. Nay, some of them are impious after another manner, imagining Yahuwah, our Mashiach, right, who came in his father's name, to be a mere man, supposing him to consist of an inner being and body. But others of them suppose that Yahushua himself is the El over all, and esteem him as his own father and suppose him to be both the son and the comforter, then which doctrines what can be more detestable? This is a direct, you know, a direct refutation against the Trinity or the duality or believing that he is his own father. There's more on this to prove it. Again, the missing chapters from the Greek translation of the recognitions of Clement Book 3, chapters 2 through 11 were removed or not translated by the people who put it into English originally. And they said it because they believed in the Trinity. But in the Syriac version, it was translated correctly. And in that, Kepha directly refutes any concept of the Trinity. He clearly explains that the Father alone is the unbegotten, the self-existent one who did not come into being, 
our, our Mashiach is the firstborn of creation through whom the Father was pleased to make all things. And the Comforter is what is the word from our Mashiach's mouth that accomplishes what he specs. It's the effectual power and seal of the two. But it's like the hand in a glove, hand in a glove thing. Just as our Mashiach was made like an L and sent to the people, so he had chose Moshe to be like an L and sent to the people. As he sees, so he does. And Ab willing, Father willing, the more we go over this stuff, the more sense that will make. But he is not his own father. He is not. He is not um, the comforter. These things are given distinction. And that's why it says in Yahukanon, there are three, not three in one, but there are three that bear witness in the Shamayim because they're they're unique and individual. The Father is greater than all. The Comforter only does whatever it's told. Right? The Mashiach is obedient to the Father in all things, but has been given all authority. There are distinctions that we can find even in the common scriptures. We just have to be be careful when we pay attention to these things. It says others again of them do refuse certain meats and say that marriage with the procreation of children is evil. And this is something that Catholics do to this day, right? Not not universally, but they, they will not eat certain meats on, on certain days, right? Or some people within the new messianic movement, right, will even say that eating meat was never commanded, sacrifices were added in, or some crazy stuff like that. But these were Gnostic opinions from 2,000 years ago as well, at the instigation of demons trying to confuse people through the, the uh, devices of Satan. So it says, Others again of them do refuse certain meats and say that marriage with the procreation of children is evil and the contrivance of the devil. And being unrighteous themselves, they are not willing to rise again from the dead on account of their wickedness. Wherefore also they ridicule the resurrection and say, We are set apart people, unwilling to eat and to drink. And they fancy that they shall rise again from the dead, demons without flesh, meaning disembodied spirits, right? Who shall be condemned forever in eternal fire. Fly therefore from them, lest you perish with them in their impieties. If you want more on what the Gnostics held to and the different sects that were being brought up, you can look at Irenaeus's or Irenaeus's Against Heresies, which is a five-volume set, and it goes in ad nauseum into detail about that stuff. It says, Of some Yahudi and Gentile observances. Now, if any persons keep the Yahudi customs and observances concerning the natural emission and nocturnal pollutions and the unlawful conjugal acts, or sorry, and the lawful conjugal acts, Leviticus 15, let them tell us whether in those hours or days, when they undergo any such thing, they observe not to pray or to touch a, or to touch the scriptures or to partake of the bread and wine. And if they owe it to be so, it is plain they are void of the Kodesh Ruach, which always continues with the trustworthy. For concerning the set-apart persons, Shalomo says, that everyone may prepare himself, that so when he sleeps it may keep him, and when he arises it may talk with him. Proverbs 6.22 Or if you think, O woman, when you are seven days in your separation, that you are void of the Kodesh Ruach, then if you should die suddenly, you will depart void of the Ruach and without assured expectation in Elohim. Or else you must imagine that the Ruach always is inseparable from you as not being in a place, but you stand in need of prayer and of bread and wine and the coming of the Kodesh Ruach as having been guilty of no fault in this matter. Meaning a woman during her separation is not to be, you don't follow the same things. It was to teach righteousness. It was to teach things at that time that it was put in place. 
but it is no longer applicable. You can still partake of the of bread and wine. You can still be in the assembly. You just don't you don't do like you're not intimate with your wife during that time. Okay. For neither un or sorry, for neither lawful mixture, nor childbearing, nor the menstrual purgation, nor nocturnal pollution can defile the nature of a man or separate the set apart ruach from him. Nothing but impiety and unlawful practice can do that. For the set apart ruach always abides with those that are possessed of it, so long as they are worthy, and those from whom it is departed, it leaves them desolate and exposed to the wicked spirit. Now every man is filled either with the Kodesh Ruach, or the set apart, or the unclean Ruach. And, and this is gone in detail. You can find it in the vision of Amram, in the two Ruachoth, or spirits that rule over all men, in the exhortation, or I believe it's the exhortation of the Damascus document. It could also be in the the, the community rule but it's part of what's called the two ways it's mentioned in the testament of Yahuda and I believe the testament of Asher it's also mentioned in the shepherd of Hermas the epistle of Barnabas and the apostolic constitutions so you have a, 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 there's a great deal of information about this okay you're, you're either filled with one or the other and it plainly says to the to the to the intent or to the effect of your loving truth, so you are of the good, and to the part of which you are bound in wickedness, you are infused with the other. Pretty simple. It says, and it is not possible to avoid the one or the other unless they can receive opposite spirits or ruachoth. For the comforter hates every lie, and the devil hates all truth. But everyone that is immersed agreeably to the truth is separated from the diabolical spirit and is under the Kodesh Ruach. And this is what's important. During the time before he came, they were intermixed. You had the evil and the good dwelling together in the body of a man. In proportion to how they would be, they were filled with one or the other. Those that were anointed and immersed, like the monarchs or the Kohanim, they were separated from the evil Ruach and had only the, the Kodesh one until they went perverted, if they did. And after he came, when you go through renouncing Satan and being immersed in his name and doing things in the lawful manner as prescribed in the Apostolic Constitutions here, you are separated from the devil's spirit, if you will, or Malki Rasha, the king of evil, and you are only indwelled with the Kodesh Ruach so that you're like Adam before his fallen state, until or unless you go perverted again, in which case you're going to have problems. <clears throat> but it says, And the set-apart Ruach remains with him so long as he is doing good, and fills him with prudence and comprehension, and suffers not the wicked spirit to approach him, but watches over his goings. You therefore, O woman... If, as you say, in the days of your separation you are void of the Kodesh Ruach, you are then filled with the unclean one. Because as a man reckons in his life, so is he. This is why it's important we have to be mindful of what we choose to believe. For by neglecting to pray and to read, you will invite him to you, though he were unwilling. For this spirit of all others loves the ungrateful, the slothful, the careless, and the drowsy, since he himself by ingratitude was distempered with evil mind, and was thereby deprived by Elohim of his dignity, having rather chosen to be a devil, an adversary, or an accuser, than a chief messenger. Wherefore, O woman, eschew or cast away such vain words, and be ever mindful of Elohim that created you, and pray to him, for he is your Yahuwah, and Yahuwah of the creation, and meditate in his laws without observing any such things, such as the natural purgation, lawful mixture, childbirth, 
a miscarriage, or a blemish of the body. Since such, observe, or such observations are the vain inventions of foolish men, and such inventions have no sense in them. Neither the burial of a man, nor a dead man's bone, nor a sepulchre, nor any particular sort of food, nor the nocturnal pollution, can defile the inner being of man, but only in piety towards Elohim. And that might have been sort of meat or animal, because not all animals are food, but all animals are for the use of men, right? But only in piety towards Elohim, and transgression and unrighteousness towards one's neighbor. I mean rapine, violence, or if there be anything contrary to his righteousness, adultery, or fornication. Wherefore, beloved, avoid and cast away such observations, for they are heathenish. For we do not abominate a dead man, as do they, seeing we expect that he will live again. Nor do we hate lawful mixture, for it is their practice to act impiously in such instances. For the conjunction of man and wife, if it be with righteousness, is agreeable to the mind of Elohim. For he that made them at the beginning made them male and female, and he baracked them and said, Increase and multiply, and fill the earth. Matithyahu 19.4, Bereshith or Genesis 1.28 If therefore the difference of sexes was made by the will of El for the generation of multitudes, then must the conjunction of male and female be also acceptable to his mind of the love of boys, adultery, and fornication. Yet we do not say so of that mixture that is contrary to nature, or of any unlawful practice, for such are enmity to Elohim. For the sin of Sodom is contrary to nature, as is also with or that with brute beasts, but adultery and fornication are against the law, the one whereof is in piety, the other unrighteousness, and, in a word, no other than a great sin. Yet neither sort of them is without its punishment in its own proper nature, for the practitioners of one sort attempt the dissolution of the world and endeavor to make the natural course of things to change for one that is unnatural. But those of the second sort, the adulterers, are unrighteous by corrupting others' marriages, and dividing into two what Elohim has made one, rendering the children suspected, and exposing the true husband to the snares of others, and fornication is the destruction of one's own flesh, not being made use of for the procreation of children, but entirely for the sake of pleasure which is a mark of incontinency and not a sign of virtue. All these things are forbidden by the laws, for thus says the oracles, You shall not lie with mankind as with womankind, for such a one is accursed, and you shall stone them with stones, they have wrought abomination. Everyone that lies with a beast, slay him, he has wrought wickedness in his people, and if any one defile a married woman, slay them both. They have wrought wickedness. They are guilty. Let them die, and afterwards there shall not be a fornicator among the children of Yisrael, and there shall be or there shall not be an whore among the daughters of Yisrael. You shall not offer the hire of an harlot to Yahuwah your Elohim upon the altar nor the price of a dog, for the vows arising from the hire of a harlot are not clean. These things the laws have forbidden, but they have honored marriage and have called it Baruch, since Elohim has Baruch it, or blessed it, who joined male and female together. And prudent Shalomo somewhere says, A wife is suited to her husband by Yahuwah. And Dawid says, your wife is like a flourishing vine in the sides of your house, your children like olive branches round about your table. Behold, thus shall the man be Baruch, 
that fears Yahuwah. Wherefore, marriage is honorable and comely, and the beginning of children pure, for there is no evil in that which is good. Therefore, neither is the natural purgation abominable before Elohim, who has ordered it to happen to women within the space of thirty days for their advantage and healthful state, who do less move about and keep usually at home in the house. Nay, moreover, even in the Basora, when the woman with the perpetual purgation of blood touched the saving border of, our, of the master's garment in hope of being healed, he was not angry at her, nor did he, nor did complain at her or of her at all. But on the contrary, he healed her, saying, Your belief has delivered you. When the natural purgations do appear in the wives, let not their husbands approach them, out of regard to the children to be begotten. For the law has forbidden it, for it says you shall not come near your wife when she is in her separation. Leviticus 18.19, Yechezkiel or Ezekiel 18.6 Nor indeed let them frequent their wives' company when they are with child, for when they're pregnant. For they do this not for the beginning of children, but for the sake of pleasure. Now a lover of Elohim ought not to be a lover of pleasure. You can enjoy, but the purpose of being intimate is procreation. So if you're not having that as your goal, it's not something you ought to be doing, is what he's getting at, which is exactly what Kepha says in the Recognitions of Clement. How wives ought to be subject to their own husbands, and husbands ought to love their own wives. <clears throat> you wives be subject to your own husbands, and have them in esteem, and serve them with fear and love. As set apart Sarah honored Abraham, for she could not endure to call him by his name, but called him master when she said, My master is old. In like manner, you husbands, Love your own wives as your own members, as partners in life, and fellow helpers for the procreation of children. For, says he, rejoice with the wife of your youth. Let her conversation be to you as a loving hind and a pleasant fowl. Let her alone guide you and be with you at all times. For if you are very, or if you are every way encompassed with her friendship, you will be happy in her society. Love them, therefore, as your own members, as your very bodies. For so it is written, Yahuwah has testified between you and between the wife of your youth, and she is your partner. I and no other has made her. Should we have made her? And she is the remains of your Ruach. And take heed, to your ruach and do not forsake the wife of your youth. An husband, therefore, and a wife, when they come together in lawful marriage and rise from one another, may pray without any observations and without washing are clean. But whosoever corrupts and defiles another man's wife or is defiled with a harlot, unharlot, rather, we don't do this in English anymore, but if you go back into the older way things were written, they'd put on before H words, just like they put that before any vowel, because the hey was a vowel in Hebrew, and it carried over into the English until it was dropped in more modern times. This is, or is defiled with an harlot, when he arises up from her, though he should wash himself in the entire ocean and all the rivers, cannot be clean. Section 6. Conclusion of the Work That it is the custom of Yahudim and nations or Gentiles to observe natural purgations and to abominate the remains of the dead, but that all this is contrary to Nazarim. It says, Do not therefore keep any such observations about legal and natural purgations as thinking you are defiled by them. Neither do you seek after Yahudi separations or perpetual, perpetual washings or purifications upon the touch of a dead body. 
but without such observations assemble in the assemblies, reading the set-apart books, and singing for the martyrs, witnesses which are fallen asleep, and for all the set-apart ones from the beginning of the world, and for your brethren that are asleep in Yahuwah, and offer the acceptable bread and wine, the representation of the royal body of Mashiach, both in your assemblies and in your homes, and in the funerals of the departed, accompany them with singing, if, if, they were trustworthy in Mashiach. For precious in the sight of Yahuwah is the death of his set-apart ones. And again, my inner being return unto your rest, for Yahuwah has done you good. And elsewhere, the memory of the righteous is with Ecumenius, or is requited. This Proverbs 10.7 And the inner beings of the righteous are in the hands of Elohim. That's Chokmah, or Wisdom of Shalomo, chapter 3, verse 1. For those that have believed in Elohim, although they are asleep, are not dead. For our Deliverer says to the Sadducees, Yet concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which is written, I am the Elohim of Abraham, and the Elohim of Yitzhak, and the Elohim of Yaakov. Elohim, therefore, is not the Elohim of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Exodus 3.6 and Luke 20.38 And you can find out more of this in Yahusuf or Josephus' discourse, discourse to the Greeks about Hades, Ezra chapter 7. Uh, I believe there's some mention of it in Baruch, the dwellings of the dead that's mentioned in the book of Hanok, the fact that Havel or Abel speaks, his blood speaks out of the ground after his death to Elohim. You also have the account of the, the slain of the Nephilim crying out to the messengers above. Your, your soul, if you will, your nephesh does not die, but goes to the place of its habitation, whether close to the lake of fire or in the place of the righteous where they dwell until the resurrection. It says, wherefore, of those that live with Elohim, even their very remains are not without honor. For even Elisha the foreteller, after he was fallen asleep, raised up a dead man who was slain by the pirates of Syria. For his body touched the bones of Elisha, and he arose and revived. Now this would not have happened unless the body of Elisha were kadosh, or set apart, and chased Yahusuf, embraced Yaakov after he was dead upon his bed. Also, Yaakov was in the bosom of Abraham when Abraham died, and he woke up there, right? And Moshe and Yahushua, the son of Nun, carried away the remains of Yahusuf and did not esteem it a defilement. Hence you also, overseers and the rest, who without such observations touch the departed, ought not to think yourselves defiled, nor abhor the remains of such persons. But avoid such observances, for they are foolish, and adorn yourselves with set-apartness and chastity, that you may become partakers of immortality, and partners of the kingdom of Elohim, and may receive the promise of Elohim, and may rest forever, through Yahushua Mashiach, our deliverer. To him, therefore, who is able to open the ears of your hearts to the receiving of the oracles of Elohim, administered to you both by the good news and by the teaching of Yahushua Mashiach of Nazareth or Hanetzari, who was impelled under Pontius Pilate and Herod and died and rose again from the dead and will come again at the end of the world with power and great esteem, and will raise the dead, and put an end to this world, and distribute to every one according to his deserts. To him that has given us himself for an earnest of the resurrection, who was taken up into the Shemaim by the power of his El and Father in our sight, who ate and drank with him for forty days after he arose from the dead, 
who is sat down on the right hand of the throne of the majesty of El Shaddai, upon the cherubim, or the cherubim, to whom it was said, Sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool, whom the most Baruch Stephan, or Stephanos, saw standing at the right hand of power and cried out, and said, Behold, I see the Shemaim opened, and the son of Adam standing at the right hand of the Elohim. Acts 7.56 As the high Kohen of all the rational orders, through him worship and majesty and esteem be given to El Shaddai, both now and forevermore. Amen. I thank you very much for allowing us to read that. And Father willing, Ab willing, you are edified and we can all learn and grow through this. You have a wonderful rest of your Shabbat and we'll see you next time.